Five, four, three, two, one. Welcome to Life Lesson 101. Welcome to the Purple Chair. Brooke, how are you? G'day, mate. I'm pretty good. Did you just say Cura? I said g'day, mate. Oh, good day. <laughs> good day. Good day. God, I don't Kia ora. Kato. I look Māori, so I mean, I could get away with it. Like you say you look Māori. You not. You haven't got any Māori in you not at all. Not at all. No. Not at all. Half Japanese, but I look Mexican as well. So it's kind of like, hola, cómo está? <laughs> Muy bien. <laughs> bien, God. <laughs> bueno. <laughs> so, you, okay, I won't go down that route. No, we no, could get right. into a whole it's bunch right. of cultural wars here. Yeah. You know, I could say, build the wall. <laughs> build the wall. Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> hey, um, well, we're in Ireland. We haven't really got a wall to build. <laughs> So um, let me just, let's just, uh, you're, I figure you're a different man today. I suppose so. Physically? Yeah. How about mentally? Do you think mentally you're different? Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Do you think that's the biggest change? I think, yeah, definitely. 100%. Right. Oh, wow. Well. Hey, just pull it's that mic a little bit closer to you, man. Just, yeah. Little, there you go. Yeah, it's cool. It won't attack you. Although it Stay. might. Stay. <laughs> Uh, so, um, you've got a really amazing story. Mm. Although, you know, you, you, yeah, I know. Okay, whenever <laughs> we say, you know, you, you've got an amazing story, mm. I mean, there's always a question in ourselves whether or mm. not our story is amazing. But yeah. For me, I think, I think it is. So, I've known you about a year now, mm -hmm. and you came to me as a, a student, mm. and I didn't learn until very recently about what you... Have accomplished, I Have suppose. accomplished, mm. yeah. Um Outside of the voice, mm. and you're coming on really well anyway with the voice, so it mm. shows you're a guy who's got some determination. But mm. what I wanted to do before we get into this uh, discussion about your transformation. Mm. It's, just, it's just like right in my face. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. It looks great from the camera angle. Oh, so. yeah, it's all good. Um, <laughs> you were a big kid. I was pretty chunky, yeah. I was thick. <laughs> what got you to that uh, state? I mean, was were there any traumas in your life? Was it? Yeah, so I was always a fat kid, and definitely progressively got bigger each year. I think I'm sure I gained like five kgs every year. Um, and yeah, I've done a lot of psychoanalyzing on where's and hows and whys. When I was a kid, I remember tracking it down. My mum owned like a little like shop in town and so after school or even before that, before I even went to school, I'd just hang out there like all the time. So, I mean, you'd make yourself busy, go around town, like, you know, find something to do, play around, playground, whatever. But then like after a while you kind of get bored, come back and then mum will give me like two bucks for like a, you know, like a treat, like a ice cream or something. And from a young age, doing that often like creates that reward system in your brain. It's like, ooh, treat good feels I want that more often I want to do that a lot so then every time I was bored I would just get a treat it kind of got to the point where I'd even take money out of my mum's purse to go buy myself you know like you you know, ice cream chocolate and snacks steal steal yes right. steal from my mum right. this is like oh, seven year old brook I don't know yeah. like you know young and then I definitely learned that boredom well like I, I created that annoying kind of connection that's like I'm bored snack good feel so then that became a habit and then comfort eating eventually like essentially mm. um boredom or just alone i suppose mum worked a lot and yeah. so you were single but your mum was single uh no no dad was there but like i think i just spent more time at the shop you know just because right. like she had to stay over and stuff um so that created that habit i think and then as you know it, it became a coping kind of thing like a cru crutch Mm. Um, you just go to it's like it's like your first drug addiction essentially food right. and, and especially sweets like and it's, but it's, it's a drug that you can't do without well that's the thing yeah food is it's hard because it's something you you need but yeah generally it's more than junk food like sweets and such um because sugar is highly addictive, especially you know, to kids as well. And they say it's like seven times more addictive than cocaine. So like, again, it's because it's like, it doesn't seem that bad for you. And it's really nice. So it's it's easy to get hooked on, obviously. But yeah, so definitely, yeah, I, was, I was big. Very big. <laughs> yeah. And so, so, I mean, take us through your, 
your kind of routine as you as you grew up. And I mean, so here you are, seven year old, making mm. money out of your mother's purse. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, but the life of crime didn't continue after that. No, no, well, no. <laughs> but definitely did that quite a little bit. But you know, just like even at home, you just find random food to eat, and just whenever I was bored, I'd eat and. You know, it's funny because like my my mum and my brother had a funny way of as soon as like I was pretty big actually, you know like pretty much all my childhood I was fat, but like their <laughs> means to make me lose weight was basically to bully me. It was really? pretty much it was just kind of like just fat shame me. And this is like my mum's Japanese, and it's like kind of a weird culture like where, especially in Japan, it's not very acceptable to be overweight. Um, it's not normal per se, and literally what, ca- even with sumos. Yeah, that's weird. That's weird. Like it's like because it's a sport. It's like it's allowed and accepted, but like in schools, like kids get absolutely traumatized and bullied for being even slightly you, overweight. You were brought up in Japan at all? Nah, ever? nah. I, I mean, I went and visited like right. every year when I was a kid, but yeah, but like, even then, like neighbors in Japan and stuff would just kind of comment on just how big I am be like oh you're quite big aren't you, you know? oh, right. as a kid growing up I mean, in New Zealand like it's not you know it's not that uncommon you know like we've got a bigger obesity kind of rate in New Zealand in comparison to Japan anyways but you know it was kind of weird it's like oh why are these people just like so caught up on this it's like because you're a kid you don't really care about how you look per se hmm. and so I think that's why I never really tried but yeah it was, it was kind of like I remember mum said, it's always in Japanese, it was like, uh, she, you know, just kind of fat shame me or whatever, just call me fat. And she's like, if you feel bad about it, do something about it. Kind of, It's like, in a weird way, she felt that her, like, like making those comments would make me feel, you know, something to do something about it. But I'm, right. I'm just a kid. That just makes you feel shit. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think, I think that's some... Um... And that, in turn, makes you want to just go eat more as comfort. I was, I was told something a little while ago, um, and there's an element of truth in it, although I, I have kicked back against it a little bit, but it was um, mm. uh, my, one of my um, therapists from 10 years ago now, mm. maybe about that time, he said to me that affirmations are like icing on a turd. <laughs> it doesn't matter how much good stuff you kind of tell yourself. If you feel like shit, mm. you're still you're still shit. Mm. You know, I mean, and, it's, and and I understand that completely because if if the the confirmation every day or the affirmation is you're fat, <laughs> you should do something about it. And I don't know if if you're anything like like me at all. But mm. I mean, I've never been one who's want to work for another man. I've never wanted to obey another man. Mm. I've always wanted to be a free spirit. Mm. Um, do, do you fit into that character? That category? Oh, definitely. Oh well, yeah. So like, does it mean you don't like being told what to do? Yeah. Oh, yeah. hundred yeah, percent. Yeah. <laughs> I'm very much like that. I think that's something I've learned to calm down as I've gotten older. Like you realize that it's more of like an ego thing. And sometimes like in a workplace, you kind of have to, abide by some rules like yeah. you know like there are managers it's kind of their job even if you don't agree with their work etc it's kind of like okay whatever like my job title is my job title so i'll just go with that but before it was like i really kind of walked around like you know it's like i know better than you basically right. and so like it was like ego work i kind of worked on but it's a separate conversation i think <laughs> but, but but i think ego has a lot to do with how we perceive ourselves mm. right I mean- so actually no that's a good point I, I wondered why i had such an ego problem per se. Even in school, I was always very belligerent to teachers and authority and such. Mm. And I think it was always, you felt like you're always trying to prove yourself, like everywhere you went. And it could be from literally from that childhood experience of always being told that you're less than or like not enough. And yeah, it's interesting when you kind of dive into this sort of stuff. Like I'm, I'm into psychology, so I'm fascinated by it. And also, you know, you just kind of wonder why you you know, do the habits that you do or even your belief systems, like where they come from. So so your parents, I mean, talking mm. about, um, you know, where do those belief systems come from? But, mm. but how about your gene? Did you, did, are any of your parents obese at no, all? Or? No, 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 it was right. just me. And yes. so that's where it's like a clear indication that it was just environmental and also how I, yeah, coped with stress and this right. and that. But, you know, yeah, definitely environmental for sure. Um it probably didn't help that 
as much as my mum would always just say, oh, you shouldn't eat this because it did got carbohydrate. Like, <laughs> like mum, you don't know shit. No. Nah. <laughs> but, like, it was it was never actually trying to help. It was just, just a comment. Right. And then usually they weren't very helpful comments. So, right. in turn, it didn't really. My brother probably at some point helped more because he would actually go take me to exercise, like, go play basketball and stuff. And he'd be like, all right, 10 more. Like, <laughs> yeah. like you know, he actively tried. And so that bit I kind of appreciated and you know, because he was actually trying something, right? But, you know, at the end of the day, n- none of my family knew about nutrition or anything. That's something I kind of figure out on my own, like, completely. And that was, yeah, in um, uni. So basically when I got to university, I was probably at the worst shape of my life. I was, so what, 100 kgs? 100, k- 100 kgs? 100 kgs, I'm like 5'2", so that's just a big ball. <laughs> 100, 100 kgs, so... The, the, uh, like, so f- in stone, well, f- what is that? So, uh, is so, okay, so, well, no, don't worry about stone. stone? So, I think so I yeah, I mean, British, in Britain it's, it's Brits. stone. In England it's stone. I mean, yeah, I know. But I know 100 <laughs> kgs is, I mean, look, I'm... A lot, basically. I'm, I'm 76 hmm. kgs hmm. at five foot eight. Hmm. Five foot eight. So it's, compact, more weight on that on a shorter frame. And yeah. It's just, <laughs> <laughs> just yeah. big um, And I used to smoke a lot Since I was a kid um, well, When did you start oh, smoking? Like 16, 17, 16? something like that And so at 19 I was 100 kgs Smoking like you know, like 10 cigarettes a day Right Completely unhealthy, so bad. Like it's funny because I was always a sporty kid in school. Like I love basketball and soccer and snowboarding, but it was just my eating. I just had a terrible eating habit. I think. Um, but you had spoke. You had. You do. Men- I mean, you've mentioned already that you've got that as a comfort food mm. or, a, or a way of comfort. You spoke about loneliness. You said about mm. feeling a bit alone. I mean. Yeah, I feel like everyone kind of feels. I think also being fat, like yeah, you know, relationships and stuff. It doesn't come so easy, and it's a bad, vicious, repeating cycle. In the sense that you're like, ah, oh, lonely, don't have like relationships, no one wants me, etc. Eat more food to make me feel good. Like it's it's very true, and it's it's actually quite common with people who have that kind of food addiction and. They use it as a comfort at the end of the day. And a lot of times it does come from a family thing, like either grandparents or parents that used to feed the kid, like, and that would be their bonding time. Yeah. And so as an adult, they attribute those good feelings to, you know, yeah, just good feelings. Yeah. And so you want to continue that. Yeah, try, try to have Christmas all round. Mm, all year all round. All the time, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Pretty much. I mean, I think there was a guy in the UK who had Christmas pudding every day because he liked the I feeling of Christmas. Pudding. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Who likes Christmas anyways? You know, yeah. Christmas. <laughs> Christmas. Haba humbug. <laughs> so look, hey, look, I want one of the things I wanted to do um is to pull up that first photo mm. uh of uh you on the beach. Mm. Uh, and yeah, let's so, have a look at that. Yeah. Uh so uh, how would you how were you here and um Um so here this would have been before I started my weight loss journey, uh, not not too like bef- not too far before that. English. <laughs> <laughs> not too far. Ba- not too ba- far. <laughs> I'm half Japanese. I'm right. Yeah, no, you're right. No. <laughs> you speak Japanese too. Yeah, I'm pretty much fluent. Yeah. Oh right. Yeah. Wow. But um, so yeah, that that was me. Like and you could just tell in the body language. Like I'm just just big and right. just depressed and like you know just right. not, yeah, not you a, kind of had your hunched shoulders yeah. you're kind of walking along there yeah yeah and it's yeah it's not fun being that big like but it's something you just got used to and that to be fair that's all i knew that's all i ever mm. knew i mean i was normal weight when i was like four or something you know young young and so like in my brain it's like oh it's not like i was fat my entire life since birth right. you know like so there was a so moment, you don't believe in the fat gene no <laughs> the fat gene no, well, I mean, like, I have Japanese, you know, genes. That's generally quite a lean culture, like, gen- right, like yeah. society. So, like, to be fair, I feel like anyone can be fat if right. they yeah, yeah. had those habits and that, that consistency. <laughs> you know, you, know, <laughs> you, you should, can be fat too. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? I mean, and, and, and look, I mean, so there we have that first image of you. And, and, uh, and you know, we live in a society right mm. now, I mean, where there are, there's a kind of like a ju- juxtaposition. Mm. So we are constantly told, uh, be healthy. Yeah, please do take a drink. Mm. Um, 
not the hard stuff. <laughs> um, but, you know, be healthy. You know, you see these guys and they're ripped. Mm. Um, uh, and it, we've got magazines showing, you know, the Matthew McConaughey's, who's really, really just ripped as. And then you have somebody mm. like uh, Channing Tatum. These are actors, mm. these are stars. They've worked on their roles. You mm. know, Jake Gyllenhaal in that, mm. Gyllenhaal in that boxing. Gyllenhaal? Gyllenhaal. 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 Jake Gyllenhaal, yeah. Jake Gyllenhaal. No, he's not. He's it's Gyllenhaal, surely. Brit. <laughs> oh, okay. Fair enough. <laughs> but anyway, there you go. You've got these examples of extreme fitness. Now, I mean, yeah. they're obviously believable because mm. you can get there. And, and there are mm. people, you know. Who that... have. Yeah, so that was my motivational factor, though. Like, after just kind of, like, deciding and committing to doing it, mm. I just literally just, probably for that entire year, just YouTubed motivational fitness like uh, like more aesthetics so like the top of body uh bodybuilding right. not the big guys but like the uh more like the male model physiques right. yeah, so yeah. there's like different categories and the aesthetics um it's like it's huge like basically gym go gym goers who want a mean physique you know they want an aesthetic body mm. and that's like yeah like male model basically yeah. and it's like wow I, I would love to look like that and yeah. like actually that motivated me enough until I kind of come to realize later on you're like some of it's unrealistic because some they do use steroids and such but at the start of it I was just I was like I want bloody well, that was eight pack yeah abs like, right. yeah it was um but you know yeah. just but what I was looking at is this, you know, we have that fitness side. But the other side of that is that um, there's this, I don't know if it's a thin line, but there is a line about fat shaming mm. and uh, the, the you know, uh, what, what do they call it these days? The, the accepting... Uh, the um, body image. Yeah, it's, um, yeah. Accept. Yeah, there's this, Something this like, you know, being called. big and accepting. It. So, yeah. so look, how do we cross this line of saying, I need to do something about this because we know scientifically that obesity is responsible for, mm. or, or is at least heart one of the parts, yeah, you know, cancers, diabetes, heart disease, etc. Mm. We know that that's factual. Mm. But how do we also balance the line of being self-accepting? What did you do? Well, yeah, it's deep because I think it's different for everybody. I think the people that there, – there's there's always going to be the toxic side of every new thing. Right. Veganism, whatever. There's always going to be the militants and then the people who are completely opposing it. Right. Uh, and the militants are the ones who give a bad name for people who just genuinely want to do it for – because they feel bad for animals. Yeah. But then there are people like, you shouldn't even put eat food off the same grill as the same person, this and that. And it's yeah. like when you get very – black or white that's when it kind of gets wrong and there's people who what yeah what's like except uh, what is it i forgot what's the word <laughs> body acceptance i it's, think it's, it's not even that is it it's, I, it's something some, similar it is like that, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah but like i get where they're coming from but then some people take it the wrong way and be like sweet i can be absolutely morbidly obese and just accept myself and be okay like there's a point to truth there's like a point of truth to that but you should be trying to get healthier. I think regardless of how you look, you should always be aiming to get healthier mm. uh, and continuously eating junk food. I think actually, yeah. I mean, look, I mean, if you consider it, you know, mm. Tyson Fury, he was uh, 28 stone. No, I don't know what that is, right? 28 stone. Now, when he fought... A lot. That's like yeah, 200, 200 massive. kgs. It's 400 Oh, Four hundred yeah. pounds, I oh, think right, it is. Yeah. Some, I think, I think, I think something it's, ridiculous. Yeah, yeah, something ridiculous. I mean, he's six foot nine, and and he said, mm. um, but, but and you looked at how he carried that weight; it was all in the mm. front and everything. Now, then his his fight with uh, Deontay Wilder, mm. he was nineteen stone, so that was two seventy something like that, two hundred seventy mm. pounds. Two hundred seventy pounds is still a lot of pounds, mm. but he carried it differently. Mm. So. I, I, you know, I think about what you're saying. This, this, this idea that you can take this too far. I'll accept mm. myself. Mm. And if you look at what Tyson Fury was saying, this idea that you know I had suffered with mental health issues. Mm. So if you couple this idea with obesity, mental health mm. issues, one could possibly draw the conclusion that 
if you accept yourself in the unhealthy state, there may well be anxiety, depression. Mm. If you accept yourself in that way, mm. but yet you could carry weight mm. healthily, mm. especially especially muscle. Yeah, well, I think I think the the body acceptance, whatever the thing's called, it's yeah, it's not really about the weight. It's literally about. Uh, like in the extremes, it's literally people who have far too much excess fat. Uh, like, accept yourself. That's never a bad thing, ever. But it's the fact that if they're not going to change anything about it and say that's okay, I think that's where the, there's a good bunch of people that are split. Because I think, yeah, they're like fitness people on YouTube and stuff, that they agree to a point that you should accept yourself, but you should probably also get yourself healthy. Yeah. But... I mean, each to their own. People are allowed to do what they want, right? But in the same breath, there are people who are bulimics, anorexic. Mm, which is, we, yeah, equally we, bad. Yeah, we worry about those people. Mm. We worry about them. Mm. And and we um, it, we are really... I mean, I think of many... I mean, you probably won't know this one, but I think of... A, a, I think her name was Lena Zavaroni from years ago, you mm. know? Uh, Karen Carpenter. Don't know. <laughs> I'm obviously very, very old. Very old. <laughs> but you know, the, you know, the the problem wasn't obesity. Mm. The problem was not being um, having any the right nutrition. Mm. Mm. Effectively, mm -hmm. there was nothing. There was nothing there. Yeah. So if we care so much about people who haven't got the right nutrition, mm. uh, and we, we do care about people who starve, don't we? Mm. I mean. No, there are charities yeah. mm. based on feeding people, mm. right? Mm. So, yeah. I so think on the other end, yeah. Why shouldn't we care about people who are? I think that's the thing. That's where the stigma comes in, because I think fat people. I think that's the thing. It seems like it's kind of like fat people versus skinny people. It's like this war, and when fat people get shamed, it's because they're kind of out of the norm but then it's like so are underweight people but because they're underweight just because they're not fat and maybe in clothes they look okay do you know what I mean like they're thin and like that's what fat people aim for so it's like they don't get as much hate because it's not as starkly different uh, and I think yeah the acceptance thing comes from fat people being just shamed for too long mm -hmm. which is also not good like what like don't don't go bullying people, basically. Yeah. Like that's, it's, I think it's just common sense. Yeah. But it should be down to the individual to want to do whatever with their body. Mm. So yeah, but it's yeah, it's hard. Um, it's it's a touchy subject, I think, it for is. some people. It is. So me, on your journey, yeah. Oh, God, sorry. So, no, go on. Like, I mean, because I remember when I was a kid. Into the mic. So, oh. Well, you know, you don't have to touch it. I'm just saying more this way. <laughs> yeah. Um, because I remember, I think just like my friends and. My family, like my mum and my brother, were my my worst bullies basically in school. Like, right. like school age, like you all my hurt friends, the ones you love. All, all my friends, like school people I was around, literally never commented on my weight, right. even though I was big. I think that you know, it's just the acceptance. So I accepted it, kind of thing. It's like I never had a problem with being bullied, so like it wasn't such a big thing for me to want to change. But that's not the same for everyone, right. and it's a really sad fact. Um, I do remember. One time, though, it was like maybe year 12, so I was 17, 18, uh, probably like 17, 16, something like that. Um, one of my close friends, <laughs> well, I think we were about to get lunch or something. We were in the car and he was like, Brooke, like, have you ever like really, really, like, I don't know what he said. It was like, basically, he was just like really concerned about my weight. It was the first time my friend really sat down and told me like, do you feel like, oh God, I wish I could remember what he said. Do you think you're healthy? It was something along the lines of that. It's like, and have you ever really considered trying to lose weight? And it was like a, a very somber, serious kind of tone of voice. It wasn't a joke. It wasn't, I was just like, oh, it was like the first time everyone really pulled me aside and like addressed it. And I was like, oh yeah, yeah. Like I exercise and stuff like, yeah. like, cause I played sport and stuff. So I think that was my excuse, even though I didn't eat well. Um, but I think that sat with me for a bit. Cause I was like, oh, that was odd. <laughs> cause it was the first kind of like 
yeah, someone's addressed it to me. It wasn't bullying, it wasn't anything. It was just like, I think the serious tone of it like kind of made me realise, I'm like, oh, shit, maybe this is kind of an, an issue. Well, you, you've got this photo of you at 18, mm. uh, and then you, what, I think it was a couple of years later, was mm. it? So, yeah, it was at my fattest and roundest is photo on one side. The other one was taken like two years ago or so so this is like well into right. me going to the gym a lot and well into your training yeah so like, but a massive difference yeah. and i think everybody can see that you mm. know so here you were 18 here you, uh you're 20, 20 i'm 25 now so it would have been like 23, 23. 24 right. somewhere around there um yeah so like for the longest time i really wanted to do like a big transformation like biggest fattest photo <laughs> to just the leanest i've ever been like yeah. most healthy like muscular but so like that journey was never like a linear journey. And so like I started off like, so I had no clue, like internet research, sure. But like, it was like, well, maybe you should just not eat junk food. That was the first thing. Just cut out all sweets, cut out all junk food of any sort. I'm like, okay. And then I read something about like low carb. I'm like, okay, I could do that. And then so I just ate no carbs for like a year or well, probably more. Um, and this was at my uni hall. So I, and then I learned about intermittent fasting. So it, it, it just like, the more I did it, the more serious I got about it, mm. which helped, but it was kind of got bad at some points, you know? So I learned about intermittent fasting, which is generally like a typical one should be you fast for 16 hours and then you eat in an eight hour window. Right. But then most of those hours that you're fasting, you're sleeping. Right. So it's not too difficult after you get into a routine, but I got kind of too good at it. I would go to one meal a day, which was dinner, at my hall. I would only eat the meats and vegetables, no carbs. And then I'd go up to my hall room, which was like a tiny water closet, and I'd work out with dumbbells for like 20, 25 minutes. And then I would just sit up watching YouTube videos about fitness all night until like, I, I went nocturnal, because this is all I did. This is crazy, right? I did nothing. That Like, I wasn't very like focused on school like I was I almost made that my life really um and so yeah basically I'd do that go to sleep at like like eight in the morning <laughs> and then get up again like in the evening had my one meal which would have been trying to think about it now it's like maybe 400 500 calories and that's just for the whole day 500 calories oh maybe I had a protein shake too so like 600 calories something like that um, and yes, you lose a lot of weight doing that, a hell of a lot of weight, especially the low carb thing. That's definitely, um, helpful, but yeah. So like maybe cause the first semester I went home, um, semester break, there would have been like maybe like two months after I've started, I come home and I'd lost probably like 10 kgs, two months, maybe a bit more like 15 kgs. And so, like, that was the first time, because, like, I didn't have weight scales at my hall. Right. So it was kind of like, I was excited to go home and see how much I've lost. And I was like, whoa, like, I've never lost that much weight in my life. Like, any time I tried, maybe I lost, like, two kgs or something, <laughs> you know? It was right. nothing right. significant. That was, like, that was a motivation factor. I was like, oh, sh like, shit, I can do this. And then that motivation made me just go into it harder and just keep going. So I did that for, like, a year... And then, so that was my uni year, and then I came home. I started just, I just lived at home the second year. Um, but then I got way more into the nutrition side, and so I actually started counting calories and uh, cooking my own food and stuff. But it was still like, in my mind, I felt the lower the calories, the better. Like, that was a good day for me. So right. 700 calories, that was a good day. Go over 1,000 calories, that was a bad day. And, like, 1,000 calories is not much at all. And I'm exercising as well. Yeah. Now I'd started doing more cardio. I was doing rowing machines and stuff. So, like, yeah, basically my body was completely in starvation mode. Like, um, So so you had this, this motivation mm. and you see this archetypal human being with ripped abs. <laughs> yeah. You say... Okay, I want this, but uh, and I and I understand that. I mean, I understand understand that from a man's point of view. You know, you go, hey, gosh, this could be better. You know, <laughs> yeah. Um, 
you know, there's always this joke that you tell when you get a little bit old and you go, hey, I got one ab, <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, and you, you don't know how it's developed. It's kind of grown. It's morphed into it's just, some it's just one, male child. One, one solid pack. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> one pack. Uh, it's getting better, though. But um, <laughs> so, um, but you, you mentioned the fact that you took it too far. Yeah, so, like, basically, well, it's already taking it too far. If I, I was still intermittent fasting, like, 23 hours a day. Maybe, 23 hours. That's 20, so that whole year I did a 23-hour fast right. with one meal a day, and that one meal was only 500, 600 calories. Do you know what I mean? Like, that's severely under-eating. Yeah. Um, I had no idea. I, I'm just like, I'm losing weight. I can do this. Like, and th- the fact that I, became, like, made it a habit. But how about the strength? How about your uh, – I mean, I, I know people who eat. Like that, and they just – there's no strength in them oh, at all. So, like – oh, yeah, so that was also a bad <laughs> – um, but I was taking, like, a pre work. it's like a pre-workout. It was more just, like, a caffeinated sports drink. Like a high-burning – Yeah, so like, a like a fat burner like type a, yeah, thing. Yeah. Uh, it just had a lot of caffeine in it, basically. Right, so I would yeah, yeah. take that before my workout, which was only a 25-minute, like, kind of body weight and dumbbell workout. Um, and it's funny because I always wondered, like, every time I would stay up all night – to watch my, my YouTube videos about people. It was funny, actually. I watched a lot of people eating videos. We would like you to get some sleep. <laughs> <laughs> and you're, oh, what's the other one about sleep? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, <laughs> no. And then, um, but then the time I'd come to go to sleep, my heart would be racing out of my chest. And I'm like, I've never had that before in my life. Right, so I'm these like, massive I'm palpitations. Like, tra- yeah, heart palpitations. So I'm like, go to sleep. And it was like, I'm like, whoa, what's that about? I thought I was having a heart attack. I'm like, but I'm getting, you know, fitter and this and that. But I'm like, I don't know what that's about. <laughs> didn't know that was that about for a while, but I, that actually happened like for the rest of the year. I just became kind of normal. I think I looked it up like heart palpitations. They say it's nothing like super serious because I thought, like, am I having a heart attack? Um, but then it's like, I, I don't remember. I, just the fact that it said it's like kind of normal, not mm-hmm. normal, but like not life threatening. I'm like, okay, I'll just deal with it, <laughs> yeah. which is crazy to think. And then eventually I realized, oh God, probably like a year later, I'm like, Oh, that's from under eating. <laughs> that's from not having enough calories, and also probably the caffeine as well. But that's so true. Like, if you're not eating enough, then your body's just like just barely functioning, yeah. like just to be alive, basically. And yeah, that was that was a scary point. I think um, you got this scare. I was going to say scary. You haven't got a scary photo. I just picked up. Pi- <laughs> the I, scary photo. <laughs> I picked up on one of your words when you said scary and it just went into my head. You got this picture of you going, let's just have a look at it on screen now, uh, just like that. So that um, one's, I just look like a, a tubby, tu- tubby, te- tubby titty beer. <laughs> Very tubby. You, it, what was the significance? Was that like your first photo? So that, that was my first progress photos. All right. Yeah. So, so like, w- w- what stage was that when you had that? Literally when I started. Right. Okay. Yeah. So that's, that's a good photo to comparison just because like yeah like I was just, and you can even see in my face I'm just like real just upset and disappointed that I'm right. I'm at this stage I'm just like I've really how was that affecting your life though I mean how, mm-hmm. how about I mean how about dates how about um you know like you know the girl scene I not mean, initially like when I was that big nothing <laughs> right nothing and that was actually a key motivator for me for me it was, was it? I was depressed in life like I just, you know, I had no relationships. I was lonely. I I hated how unhealthy I was, but I felt like there's nothing I could do about it. I really thought it was my reality. Mm. I thought that that could never change. And I was really depressed wallowing in it one day. And it was in my uni room and I just, yeah, just like kind of broke down one time. And this was before I started. Right. Like probably, yeah. And it was like in the darkest kind of abyss, you're just like in pure self-misery. And then something clicked. It was like a little voice in my head. It was like, well, what do you want? What do you want? Like, what would make you happy? And I say, well, I guess I'd, I'd like a girlfriend. I'd like to be fit and have a nice body. And like, well, do it. And I've got a little little piece of this hiding over here. That, this, this is something you prepared for yourself. You wrote it out and for so you. And so I wrote this out, a message to myself, just like after I'm like, well, what do you want? And I think I remember reading like a quite an inspiration inspiring um quote i think it's from scrubs do you remember scrubs you remember scrubs i think it was like the doctor um the like older doctor right yeah, he was yeah. actually talking to like a fat patient at the time and it's funny because she was like talking about oh it's hard to lose weight or whatever it was and he just he said something that was really like for a, co- for, comedic, yeah, a comedic for, for a comedic show i'm like yeah. yo that's deep um but it says uh, like uh, some of it's a quote but i wrote 
Let me break this down to you. Life is scary. Get used to it. There are no magical fixes. It's all up to you. So get up off your lazy ass and get out there and start doing work. And if it's too hard, nothing in this world that's worth having that's worth having comes easy. Uh, drink less, smoke less, do more. Forget the past. Focus on the future. Focus on now. Stop feeling sorry for yourself, Brooke. Push. Keep working hard and never give up. Get going, kid. I believe in you. And there was something that was like coming from a third person, almost. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's in my in my head, I kind of feel like there's two me's. <laughs> yeah. Uh, which is funny. There's there's the yeah the kind of rational me and the emotional me. But, but in psychology, we do have a conversation mm. um, on many levels with uh, on this idea. That's fine. We have this idea of. Uh, you know, it's like the angel and the devil. Mm. You know, I, in actual fact, part of the work I did with uh, my counsellor was to mm. integrate the shadow. Mm. The shadow is the, you know, maybe the anger, the selfish, mm. whatever. Or the side that you don't want to face. Yeah. But it's part of you. But, you know, fat you <laughs> yeah. had to face thin you and have a conversation. That's so true. And it, it, that's actually a brilliant way to put it. That's mm. actually a brilliant way because... I never spoke to myself like that before or right. even spoke in such a determined way. It was just like, I think it was just like my last straw. It was just like, I was so fed up with literally everything in my life that, yeah, you just, you go into different levels of emotion. So you go from misery, grief, sadness, um, and then you get into anger, which is a vibration higher than sadness. But anger is actually good because it motivates you to do something. Yeah do something actually yeah. go take action uh well it was frustration and then anger mm. and then that anger it, it, it fuels you it really does and if you're really just pissed off about your life situation or whatever it is you can do something about it and that that energetic uh vibration behind anger can make you just get up off your butt and do something and luckily that did for me and as soon as i talked to myself so sternly i um it it kind of just it resonated, you know. Right. It, it like motive. I'm like, well, yeah, you're right. Like, well, what can I do? And so I just you're know, like actually stick with it. That was the main point. I said you always give up. Anytime you try to lose weight before, you just gave up. You never actually committed. You never actually tried. And so like, if you just stick with this for eight months, you will see results. I don't know why I made it eight months, but I just I just said do that. And if nothing's happened by then, then give up. Sure. Eight months. That's your goal. It's sometimes it's actually very useful to give yourself an out. Mm. You know, there's a, there's a place that you go, hey, look, it's eight months. I can mm. do this for eight months, yeah. you know? Yeah, instead of just forever. Like something about eight months, I think maybe it was the end of the year or something and I was – I, it was summertime. I think it was coming up to eight months for summer. You know, you want to get yeah. – look good for summer kind of thing. And I said, okay, and then just kind of – I think I bought a protein shake instantly online. Never done that before. And then uh, what did I do? I think I got like a little food diary, just like a piece of paper printed out, just like write what you eat a day. At first it was just common sense, just eat, just not junk food. Right. And then, um, yeah, and then exercise. I did like 20, 25 minutes of just dumbbell exercises. Yeah. Literally that. I didn't even do any cardio. Yeah. And um, so you did that for a bit. And then, yeah, so uh, the more I got used to it, um, I will change it up a bit. And then, so, yeah, got to the low carb, to the intermittent fasting, and then, yeah, just keep going. And so, like, that was the first time just something significantly changed in me right. where I did just stick with something. And then I think I became passionate about it. I really did. I became very just into fitness and nutrition and stuff. Wow. Maybe nutrition came later on, but like, yeah, just like about the whole fitness um, lifestyle, really, and and it's amazing how traumatic events can mm. can because so, so you obviously know my wife passed away about mm. three years ago, but when she was having chemotherapy, that was so traumatic mm. that there was a new energy, weirdly enough, that mm. kicked into me, mm. and it lasted right through to her death, mm. and what happened was that. I mean, I wasn't taking gluten, dairy, or sugar, mm. but I started to exercise on this 25-minute basis mm. every day in the morning, mm. and I would do 50 to 100 meters of sprints, mm. 10 press-ups, 10 squats, mm. wait for 30 seconds, 50 to 100 meters of sprints, and I did that. Mm. I was 47, and I don't know how, how much weight what I was. What motivated you to, to start that? 
I didn't want to die. <laughs> mm. I didn't want to die. And I had, I, it, was, it was almost irrational. Mm. Not really, though. Uh, but, well, from a psychological perspective, if you look at, look at it and, uh, and you, you would say, well, you're not dying, Charles. Mm. No, okay. but it, it gives you that perspective that, wow, anyone can die. That's right. Yeah. Well, I knew, and my wife was three years older than me, she, she died three weeks off her 50th birthday. Mm. So I, I started to, I'm not sure if I recognised then, but I definitely recognised after she passed away. And very recently, I've had this again, my mother passed away very recently, mm. and I started to see my, my own mortality, mm. you know, hit the age of 50. Mm. But at that time, that, that, that trauma of, you see, my, my wife was an incredibly capable person, mm. really capable. Uh, and I had never seen her weak. Mm. Never. It just kind of shakes you, doesn't it? Yeah. Mm. So when you see someone who's, you realise, well, what the hell good am I? <laughs> and I, th I think when I so when I'm listening to your story, I'm thinking there is a time mm. when the trauma of being a certain way or the trauma of it could be just as easy as just hey look I'm not successful with the opposite sex that that in and of itself <laughs> yeah. is a trauma. But yeah, and it, it it was a big motivational factor because you know that's something everyone wants it. Everyone wants to have a relationship. Everyone yeah. wants to be loved, etc. But. At the time, I'm like, that's my soul. That's the sole reason as yeah. to why. <laughs> but, but also, when you, you spoke, just, I mean, as you began, you spoke about, you know, your, your mother and your brother mm. um, probably not appropriately motivating you. <laughs> no, it didn't help at all. Right. <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to be kind. Yeah. Um, but one could say that you possibly weren't receiving the love that yeah. you required. Yeah. Um, or at least how you perceived it. Yeah, we could go deep on that. Like, because mum is Japanese and their culture is not a very emotional culture. Right. And I, even with relationships, I've always tended to be aff too affectionate and too needy. Right. And that always ended up not working out. And I always wonder, like, why, why is that? Why is it that I give love and I don't get it back? Or like, but then you do some self-analysis and you're like, I'm needy. Well, where does that come from? Mm. And it's because when I was a child, me and my brother would be fighting, whatever, and then I'll go cry to my mum. Like, I'm talking like five-year-old, you know? And mum just, I understand now she's tired, she's come back from work. She didn't have that emotional kind of support, affection from her parents. Right. Uh, she was the oldest of five kids. She had, to, she had to be an adult from a young age. So she never got to grow up. And so I guess in her mind, it's kind of like, well, if I didn't get that kind of affection, why do I need to give it... Like, it's probably not something consciously she thought, but it was no. just just it, how she was. It definitely operates beneath the seat of consciousness. Yeah. I mean, yeah, absolutely. Definitely. I mean, and I've seen I've seen that happen time and time again. Mm. Uh, I now see myself in my children and the way they mm. act. I mean, they have no idea how many messages mm. are sent back to me on a daily basis mm. from the way they look, the way they speak, the choices they make. Mm. They have no idea how much of a duplicate. <laughs> duplicate they are of either me or, right. or my wife yeah. or even the the so for instance here's a sim here's a simple one right very very simple one of my daughters loves to put things on edges and boxes <laughs> and is like that and takes forever to do it <laughs> now that's not a criticism that's just an observation yeah. of a pattern of working that works yeah. So when you see that in the life of somebody else, mm. when you when you see that, um, you totally recognise mm. that you had an impact. You've had an impact, and there is a gene pool in there, mm. and some of it's environmental evolution. Mm. Mm. So the, the the evolution of my environment mm. um, was uh, a, a suppressed anger mm. that I had to had had to work on. I mean, mm. not that I've ever mm. beaten anybody, but... Yeah, it, suppressed anger, it, it doesn't mean you're an aggressive person, but mm. suppressed anger is just energy that's trapped. Yeah. Uh, it could be sadness as well, but anger, it, it's it's a it's an emotion that needs to be let out. Mm. That's that's why most people shout and scream, which is actually kind of healthier. The ones that bottle it up, generally it comes out in random bursts or just never 
which is toxic for your body, literally. Yeah. Like, emotion is... Yeah, it, it stays in there, and yeah. it's just not good for you. Well, I was listening to... Um, I don't know if you know Candice Owens. She's a political commentator in the States, and she said something interesting. She says, I don't hate anybody because nobody feels my hate. Only I do. <laughs> right? Well, that's true. Nobody feels... I feel the hate. Mm. It's toxic to me. The mm. hate I feel is toxic to me. Mm. And so uh, if I, in my head, hate you, mm. you don't feel that. Well, yeah. If you keep it inside, yeah. It, I you mean, know. it's not doing anyone a service. Yeah, that's <laughs> yeah. right. So, so okay, so you've, you've, um, you've come to this point. You're doing this muscle in that photograph. Mm. You've, you've gone this plan. You've had these ups and downs. So... In the end, what was the point when you go, okay, I've, I'm on this trail now, but I'm really fucking up. <laughs> I mean, you know, what, when, when did you say, okay, look, I've got a hold of this nutrition shit? Well, where did we go? We went from relationships to, I don't know how it bounced off from there. But, oh, because we were talking about trauma, th- my, yeah. my motivation, my motivation. Kind of thing. And I went way back and <laughs> talking about my mum not giving me affection. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> it was just a big thing. But, um, yeah, so I keep going, and then I started getting into um, tracking my food. Right. So when I was at home, now I looked up you know, macronutrients, so that's like your proteins, carbs, and fats, and like a good composition of, you know, whatever. But at the same time, I was still eating like under a 1,000 calories right. every day and exercising. Um, and I was still doing my diaries, and I think um, it, it became like an obsessive game to just hit your numbers, you know, it would be like 50 grams of protein, right. be like, you know, something. I would, we- like, weigh on food scales lettuce to know the calories. And then I'd look it up on Google. <laughs> 10, gr- 10, grams of, yeah, yeah. 10 grams of lettuce is about two calories. <laughs> All right, jot that in. Like, it, it got obsessive, and that that's unhealthy because I wouldn't taste food, like, even if I was cooking. I would literally not taste it. Until it's done, put it in my container that I'm weighing the total and then divvy that up per 100 grams so I know exactly how much that food calorie is per 100 grams kind of thing. It was crazy. And so, like, I would, I, you know, going out to eat would just be a horrendous nightmare. Like, I would not go out to dinner with friends because I don't know how much calories is in my meal. Right. Even if you made a good, healthy salad choice whatever it is right yeah yeah. because like it was a control thing i needed that control because i've had it for so long um and so yeah like did that for a while and then so yeah i think yeah probably another photo is probably at my leanest i was about 54 kgs there and so that's in about a year and seven months i had lost what is that like 46 kgs and that's crazy that's uh, 101 Pounds, plenty of pounds. 101 pounds yeah something like that um it's you know it's crazy and i think yeah all the people around me like um like mum's friends and like you know people who just know you but oh you're losing so much weight like well done like you know you get praised for how, how well you've done but it's like you don't really know how i've done it and that's why if someone said oh how did you do it you wouldn't really want to give them exactly how i did it because it was actually a horrible way to do it it got the job done, but it just wasn't healthy. But, but you've uh, you've repented. <laughs> well, so like, so that's right. So I kept going, and then when I got down to my lowest weight, I think it, it was like the end of the road. Like my body had just had enough. Almost two years, well, probably two years of just under eating, right. literally under eating. So you're obsessed. I was obsessed, but then so from there, it was just my body just craved food, anything. Right. And so I would binge eat, meaning you'd you'd hit your goal of whatever thousand calories it was, would be sweet. And then it would be like, you'll be up watching TV and then you're just like, oh, maybe I'll just have like one more thing. And then because uh, I had that one more thing above what I already, like what my limit or whatever, I'm like, oh, fuck it. Like I just went crazy mm. and you'll just eat a thousand calories in one sitting like just anything it, it wasn't even good food i just get like toast and butter and so the very so the like very thing that you were looking to to not do you ended up doing as a result of doing something which you thought was beneficial yeah well the thing was like you just thought it was oh why don't i have 
why don't I have willpower anymore? But it was just your body literally is craving, craving food yeah. that it will just do anything to get it. And as soon as you slip that one little bit, it was just like, phew, just like free fall. And then you're like, oh, that was terrible. I need to get back on the next day. You're just like, I, I need to be good. And then just do it again and again and again. And so like I binged eat, so I, I gained more weight back. And from my lowest, I gained a bit back. I was still exercising and still trying to do the thing. But the thing is the, the binge eating, it was like – maybe twice a week and then like three times a week and they just happen more and more frequently. Right. So your body's just like... So it's just massive crave. crave. Yeah. You've got that cramp feeling that you yeah, just had you to just, fill that you space. You just need it. And, yeah. um, and then... Uh, but you're still trying to do what you've been doing the whole time even though it's just not working. So maybe I started increasing my calories a little bit. Um, and then I, I think after binge eating stuff, I'd gained maybe like four kgs or something up by then so what's that 50 you know i was maybe like 57 or something and what whatever it was um but the, the, actually even when i was like 54 no like 56 i still felt like i wasn't like where i wanted to be even though i was probably the leanest i've ever been I still had like belly fat and this, like, you know, small, yeah, tiny yeah. nuisances. And because I did so much calorie restricting and exercising, it was just, I was just skinny rather than like muscly. So, like, my physique didn't look good. Right. You know, like I was thin, yeah. but not not how I wanted Mike to be. Mike Chang from Six Pack Shortcuts. No, refers, I know. <laughs> he refers to that as skinny fat. Yeah, yeah. Pretty much, yeah. Yeah. And, um, and so that was very demoralizing because, yeah. in fact, I just did all this work and it's like I still don't look how I want to look. Yeah. Um, and then so I, I was like, okay, maybe I should just bulk then. So, like, you know, looking at <laughs> bodybuilding stuff. Yeah. But I did it so stupidly. I'm like, that just means I can eat a lot of calories. And, like, it, yeah, I just didn't go about it smart. So then I just gained, like, so like five kgs on top of that. Shit. I'm like, oh, damn it. <laughs> so I went up to, like, 64 kgs. So, right. like, from 50... So like 10 kgs, you know, over a course of a year or something. And I'm like, well, that didn't work. I need to lose weight. And then that, about that time I, st- I was coming, moved to Wellington. And so I was back on the, uh, yeah, on the like working out thing and um, still counting my calories and stuff. By then I had been eating a little more like a good day would be like 1,200 calories. But right. that's still like pretty low. So uh, like... Yeah, it kind of fluctuated a lot, and then over time, I think I increased my calories more because I started working at a, a more physically demanding workout, just like you know running around a bit more. So maybe fifteen hundred calories, and that was actually it's fine. That's actually fine, but yeah, I think because it wasn't the the drastic weight loss that I had initially I'm like oh it's not working anymore right. kind of thing yeah, yeah. even though it was it was just slower and healthier actually but um and then I think at one point I just kind of gave up um or I just keep coming back and forth it would like you just kind of eat what you want and then come back and do it for a bit um yeah so like probably the last few years it's been more of a struggle to maintain a consistency I think Probably, uh, maybe like, hmm, 2000 and 2018, I was probably the healthiest I was, musclier, leaner, so that I would have been like 50, uh, yeah, 58 kgs, uh, 60 kg. it would have been like 60 kgs, but like with muscle mass, and so that was good, but then I think I just kind of gave up and then so i've i've gained over like a year or two where am i like 64 but, but that's this, a that's a pretty good weight though 64 yeah, your height like i definitely have excess around my like waist and stuff but bmi like it, it, it's in, within the healthy range basically yeah. but yeah I, I still am determined for that that dream the initial dream is that Oh, the light's just gone out on the camera. It is. But yeah, so like in the last year, I just kind of gave up on the whole, the dieting aspect of it. I just kind of, I just stopped. I just completely but stopped. You seem to be eating normally now. But though. that's the thing. After I stopped and then I, you know, you ate whatever you wanted. After a while, it kind of gets old and then you just eat intuitively. Right. So you just, you just know what's kind of good for you and what's not good for yeah. you. So you just and, get rid of the shit and you go, well, okay. Yeah. You know, I mean, do you, do you have cheat days? Like, you know, I don't mean cheat days. But I like, mean, do you have ice cream? But yeah, well, but I'm talking like 
I just had no rules anymore. But cool. because I, it was so just, I just, you know, stopped. It wasn't that before with the binge eating where I was so strict that it was like, oh, he's going to be strict tomorrow. So just, psh, just eat as much as possible. Like you, that's your body doing that. Right. Um, but now that it's like, you just give him the okay. You're like, oh, you can do what you want. You sure you eat a bunch of crap for like a week or so and be like, oh, I feel kind of sick now. I'm going to just not eat as much. Well, not like purposely, but like not excessively basically yeah. and so you start to eat like a fucking normal human being yeah. and back then back when I was measuring and stuff I I literally didn't know how to eat like a normal person like I didn't know how to eat without measuring my food Yeah. Um, it scared the living daylights out of me to be like oh I can't track things but I'm so glad that I don't have to be like that anymore right. nowadays so like when I go back to the gym and get to a routine like I don't need to track anymore before right. I thought, oh, when I get want to get back onto it, I should track. Like sometimes I I consider doing it, but I'm like, nah, you can just kind of do it intuitively because I I generally know what's good for you, what's not. And it's funny, you know, because I feel the same thing, and I've just got back in. I mean, um, I mean, it's no secret that you know these past three years I've I've just struggled with being this mm. um, single father, you know. Mm. And I'm not I'm not I'm not a victim. You know, I don't yeah. feel like I'm a fucking victim, you know. I have, you know, I have a house. I love what I do. I teach people to sing. Mm. And uh, I have great people coming into my home. I have fabulous daughters. I have mm. a lot going on for me. Mm. But that idea, the very essence of unworthiness mm. that, I mean, I don't know if you can relate to that well, in terms of. Yeah, so like, uh, as I was saying, even when I got down to my lowest weight, I just wasn't happy. Obviously how I looked. And then I think... From there and then on to about now, like throughout those years, as much as there was still the fitness and the food stuff going on, a lot, a big mental shift happened. It was a very philosophical, spiritual kind of thing mm. uh, where you're just learning more of, about life and the things that have happened and how you've gone about it and why. It, it you know ties into psychology as well. And yeah, at that time it was like, just because I wasn't my ideal goal physique, I still felt unworthy. I still felt like that fat kid. Right. You know, so there's still days today like that you can't, because that was your whole life for what, for 18, 19 years. That's right, yeah. That's a long time. That's more than how long I've been doing this fitness journey. Yeah. Um, to have that mindset of I'm unworthy, I'm always just going to be fat. And so when I did maybe spill over and gain a few pounds, you just feel fatter with each more yeah, yeah. weight you put on and you're nothing like how you used to be and I do have to remind myself like look at that photo <laughs> like like you're nothing to who that person was basically and um yeah and so like it's a big philosophical thing and yeah accepting yourself I think um ties into it and yeah just loving yourself at the end of the day and yeah. I, I th and yeah during this whole whole thing it's like my confidence, basically. Yeah, losing the weight, it helped with the confidence. And I think the more you feel good about yourself, exercise helps you make you feel good about yourself. So, yeah. like, it all kind of helps. And then, obviously, the relationships come after that. <laughs> Definitely. Oh, look at that. That's a face that says, oh, there's a relationship. <laughs> yeah, this is kind of yeah. cool. And, you know, it... But it wasn't really the weight loss. It was definitely the confidence and competence you felt uh, from it. The the control, the fact that you can actually do something about your problem in life yeah. and actually find a solution. I have a, a, a little bit of a theory, thesis, if you mm. like. And it goes along the lines of control. And I think mm. often what control often is uh, a word that we substitute for the the real word mm. of Security. freedom. Freedom, yeah, yeah. So I, th I think what happens is confidence, um, and they don't have to be mutually exclusive. I'm not saying that control and freedom aren't, you know, they're 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 separate in their in their roles. But mm. I, th what what I see, uh, and a bit like when I teach with voices, in the end, mm. you get to know so well you. Mm. that you're no longer counting, which is the control. Mm. You're just living. Mm. And so th it isn't an, an element of control. Matter of fact, in Alcoholics Anonymous, mm. they have this phrase and it says, let go and let God. Mm. Stop trying to control mm. and let life happen. Mm. Um, Definitely. I think that was a big part of when I stopped the whole tracking food and this and that. Like I actually allowed, accepted that 
I don't need to do that anymore. Like, I don't need to feel like I have to control every tiny little bit that I eat. And that was when I was just, let, yeah, accepting just life a bit more. Yeah. I think accepting the present moment and also accepting just how you are, like how you look and just where you've gotten to. Yeah. And it, yeah, it helps just ease the mind because before what was driving it was you're not good enough, you're not good enough. Right. You're, you don't look good enough. Like, that, that was the whole driver behind it. It was a negative driver. It's a massive load of shame and unworthiness in the world, mm. you know, and I think there's there's a big drive um, to combat this, but we're combating it in the wrong way. Mm. And I think because we're looking for the control mm. um, and – I can't help but think that this lovely little saying, live and let live, you know, mm. allow allow freedom to be mm. the, the the divine principle that we're heading for. Mm. Liberty, freedom. Mm. I, just as I teach in the in singing. I wanted to tell you a funny little story actually, just um, yeah. just so twenty years ago I was working in a an office. It was a sales office and um it's where I met my uh my my best friend Steve mm. uh, in the UK. And often I went out at lunch times and I would come back in and I'd buy a little packet of peanuts or anything. Well, this time I'd bought a packet of peanuts, a packet of cashews, and I don't know. All the nuts. Something else, Arms. right? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> but there was three Pecans. packs. Each one was like two, 2,000 calories, you right, know, yeah. every pack was, you know. Oh, yeah. It was just there, just a snack on mm. kind of thing as I was making phone calls. And Steve was sitting on the other side of the dividers as I was making calls and nibbling and what have you. Anyway, he comes, he comes round kind of like towards the, I don't know, it was like one, two in the afternoon and he was feeling a bit peckish. And um, he says, oh, mate, is it okay? Can I uh, have a few of your peanuts? I'm like, oh, 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 sorry, mate. I've, I've eaten them all. <laughs> he goes, you've just had 7,000 calories. <laughs> you know? uh, so, uh, yeah, yeah. So I, was, that was, I actually went to a, a 40-inch waist, which is 101 yeah. centimetres. Um, and then... Inch, that's pretty big. Yeah, yeah, 101 centimetres. And then... I was... Oh, I, was well, I was probably close to that. Too, yeah, I had a 40-inch waist, so 101 centimetres by the time... By 2011. Hmm. And then... So you were chonky at 1.2? Just around my waist. Oh, yeah. It was, you know, and that's where I developed man boobs. Mm. <laughs> uh, and then I had... Um, I am still aware of those man boobs. <laughs> mm. <laughs> you yeah. know, that's part of that unworthiness thing. But, yeah. um, and then I gave up gluten, dairy and sugar. Mm. And then I started to exercise. Mm. And seven months later, I'd had a 32-inch waist, which was uh, 80, 80, 83. Something like that. Yeah. 82, 83 centimetres. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, yeah. But then... Good on you, mate. Yeah. Well, you know. <laughs> but, uh, no, it's just funny. I was sitting there and I'd eat, eaten 7,000 calories. Yeah. Well, yeah, I've definitely... In my binge times, I'd eat a crazy amount of food. And it was always in a very short period of time. That's when, you know, you have a binge eating disorder. That's generally they categorise it as a disorder when it's, it's always... Now, also following feelings of guilt and shame afterwards. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, God, I just ruined so much, you know, progress, this and that. And also, yeah, short period of time, a lot of calories. Um, but, yeah, I'm, I'm very grateful because I never – after all that, you just – you wonder if you could ever just eat like a normal person. Like, I just – you know, you learn, I guess, mm. as you go. And now I know a bit more about nutrition and stuff. Um, yeah. But – um. Yeah, at the minute it's kind of, it's definitely, I think it's because I don't have that intense. Definitely don't get that intense drive. I don't have no, that intense no. drive, yeah. No, the intense kind of negative drive um, to to really, you know, like go for it. Like there's a determination that comes from that. I kind of miss the, the real, ne it's negative though. It's, it's kind of right. like self-hatred in a way. Right. But it's such great fuel, and it, it gets you motivated to do things. But now it's like because I've accepted myself so much, and I, I generally love myself too much. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't think you love yourself too much. Wow. Well, okay, it could turn to narcissism. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But um, no, like you just you, you kind of get a bit more easy on yourself. You're just kind of like ah, uh, I mean, I don't, I just, I just don't have that 
craving desire. I still have that kind of, you know, kind of just I want to attain that goal eventually, right. but right. it's not like a rush. I'm not in a rush. Right. And so once I find a good kind of routine to be able to do it, I'll get there. But, yeah, right now um, – Well, I think you've got an amazing story, man. I yeah. mean, look, I mean, you know, um, just this idea of – being able to look, I mean, I th- I found the idea of that quote, the uh, not the quote, the, uh, the, the you know, your own little motivational mm. speech, you know, to have that as mm. a way to drive you forward, mm. to have it an initial spark. Mm. And the fact that, you know, you've, you are not a victim. See, this is where I think it changed me. Like, I'm two different people because before like my whole childhood and up until that point I was a victim I just said life happens to me this is just how everything is this is how it's supposed to be like I can't change it until that moment when I became the one in control I said well what do we want what do you want what do you want to do and get it go get it find it find the steps to do it and it's funny because now I'm just so like that anything goes wrong I'm just like okay what can we do right to fix it like it's it's not really emotional anymore and yeah you just when you realize you have that power to be able to take control, to do what you want, whatever that is, yeah, your mind kind of changes and you're like, you, you get you get a responsibility put on yourself. There's a quote, and it's that, that's real treasure about right there, okay, mm. to me, that's real gold. There's a quote from a, a, a woman who spoke to her son, and, and she, she, this woman lived, she was black, and she lived through segregation mm. in the States. And we all know that segregation, uh, terrible government policy, you know, it just shouldn't have been there. But she lived through it and brought her son up through it. And she said to her son, she said, never blame another man for your failings, Hmm. even if it's true. Now, I thought that was an incredible statement because... You know, segregation was a real thing. That was real racism, mm. really right in your face. And someone doing something to you. Absolutely. It was cir- yeah. it was a circumstance that you as a black individual mm. could not escape from. Well, I find this incredibly brave words. Mm. Don't blame the circumstance even if it's real, even if yeah. it's real. Because she, because she said this one final thing. She says, because when you do that, you give another man your power, mm. and and that's mm. what that's what I like about your story is that what you said is in in, in my mind is mm. actually I'm not going to give the circumstance mm. my power, mm. you know. Yeah, the the victim mentality a lot of people are still in like, and generally people who are in the life happens by me. Yeah, there's life happens to me mentality. Life happens by me. And then there's like the more philosophical life happens through me. And that's more like spiritual sort of stuff. Um, but yeah, it, it's very empowering when you kind of have that moment when you're like, oh, I can change something that I don't like. And then that really makes you feel like, oh, I can do anything really. And that's extremely powerful. But a lot of people really remain in that victim state where they're like, oh, this is just my reality. This is life. Like, But also there's a reinforcement, societal reinforcement mm. um, it's almost like there's a necessity for someone to be a victim. And I, uh, when my wife died, it was true that I had been a victim. Mm. Okay, I was a victim of a f- circumstance, and so are my children. Mm. Um, no one was to blame, really. Mm. Um, the cancer took my wife. Mm. But I had people say, say to me, just actually blatantly say to me, but Charles, it's okay to be a victim of this. <laughs> now, that in and of itself is true mm. and is supposed to be loving, isn't it? If you mm. listen to the way it's being said, but Charles, it's okay. Yeah. It's okay to be that. And sometimes the very act of being compassionate mm. is the is the is is the downfall mm. of empowerment. Even though I'm, yeah, even though I don't like to. Be, call it empowering in some ways, even though I know what it means, you know, in power, to be mm. empowered. Mm. Um, it's like everything is stripped of you, even your pride. Mm. You know, even that good... It's kind of like you're allowed to just give up, kind yes. of. Yes, yeah. Given, given to the sadness. And I think that's a real, yeah, given to the sadness. Now, I, mm. I'm not saying that one shouldn't experience your emotions. No. And I think... But one shouldn't tell you how you should feel. Right. So a good story, and this is quite deep. My father died when I was like 15. Right. Um, 
I dealt with it very strangely, and that's some circumstances leading up to it. I just it felt like a premonition, like I kind of felt it coming. It was a freak accident. Um, he was in like a caravan explosion. That's pretty crazy. Um, Here. Uh, in Christchurch, because he was a camper, like, he was went camping and stuff, but I just, you know, it was just something, like, I, I feel like I'm very intuitive, and for some reason, I just felt something not great was gonna occur, and it was still random, but, yeah, uh, I do, I just remember not feeling particularly, it was strange, it was like, he just couldn't really absorb it. I guess. Like, was that denial? Yeah, it could have been. It could have been. But at the same time, because it felt like I felt it coming, that it just felt like, yeah, it was just a bit weird. Um, and so, like, my, my dad's side of the family come down for the funeral and stuff, and, like, they've cremated his body and everything. My auntie's on my dad's side, just, like, his sister forcing me to cry, like, trying to make me show some sort of emotion, because we were really close, like, you know. Um and obviously that sort of, she was like, just cry for your father. Like, it hurt me that I, she was so sad that I wasn't sad. It was, you know, that made me sad yeah. <laughs> in a weird way. But obviously, like, I had my my grieving in waves, like, yeah. or afterwards. But, uh, yeah, at the, t- the whole thing, it was just, I didn't feel much. It was strange. I felt, I guess, surreal. But, yeah, it was it was a weird time for sure. But at the same time, sometimes... How did that affect your eating, though? Um, or did it? Was, it? it was, it was the same. Still the same? No. Still... It, like, nothing really, like, changed. Right. The only thing it was just that I felt like that had to happen. Like, life kind of, I don't know, it was, it's a weird thing. Like, without it, like, my mum wouldn't be in this beautiful house right now. Like, right. the insurance money helped us because we were in, in a bad spot. Like, right. yeah, it was just, just felt like he was crumbling a little bit yeah in weird ways and he was just maybe not thinking so much you know and you know it's just weird things that I just saw and it just it didn't come as a surprise in a weird way yeah so like yeah I don't know and uh, I don't know I just feel like any sort of severely terrible thing in life life is always kind of creating it for a purpose for a reason for a lesson at the end of it and I don't know. I just feel like I wouldn't be where I am if those circumstances didn't happen. Mm. Don't know why. Well, I think that's one of the things that I, I, I was watching a video recently and the guy speaking said, look, you know, the, the real way in which you can gain meaning in life is that everything that you do matters. Mm. And I guess if we extend that, and I, I'm, I'm loath to give things meaning. So, for instance, you know, that happened because... But you've mm. just acknowledged that it happened. I, yeah, it happened, and therefore this is me. Mm. And I think when we acknowledge something um, and its impact on our lives, mm. we are able to draw meaning from it rather than give it meaning. Mm. Yeah. You know, like, so for That's instance, true. you know, um, uh, I found my shoes this morning. God must be aware of me <laughs> right, and I don't have any problem with anybody who feels that you know God is aware of them but that's giving a, a circumstance of meaning mm. whereas you could say oh I found my shoes oh, I'm so glad I did mm. which is then see, seeing a, a benefit from a circumstance mm. you know there's a, there, yeah. you've seen the benefit of your father's yeah, yeah I guess the, pos- the positives the silver linings I guess yeah the silver linings but, um, I mean it was a fucking grey cloud man yeah definitely but and I think that's why I was getting to is everyone around me would just expect you to be in bits. And so their kind of response is always, I'm so sorry. Mm. Like I was just so strangely nonchalant about the whole mm. thing. It was very bizarre. Like, I'm just like, you know, and I, I didn't bring it up for a long time for like people I met, like not in the sense of like, I was so upset about it. I didn't want that sympathy. Because right. I knew as soon as I'd bring it up, I'd be like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. Do you think that you would have embedded yourself more into being a victim if you had heard the story more about, you know, as you recounted the story of your father's death, mm. then you embed yourself into victim? Do you think you were in that place? How do you mean? Well, so for instance, if you tell the story often enough, you might say, well, yeah, actually, I am a victim. <laughs> well, I think I just saw that 
other people saw me as a victim. Right, I didn't that's want, what, I didn't want to bring it up. Right, yeah, right. yeah, I think that's what it was. And I just knew it every time. And it, that's the thing. It was never because I didn't like want to bring it up or anything. It was literally I just knew the answer, like reply will always be, I'm so sorry, yeah. and, and just pure sympathy. Something about it, like, yeah, I guess it's a victim kind of ness they put yeah. on you that you just don't want to be. And there's a weird balance because you don't want to offend someone mm. and tell them to fuck off because <laughs> yeah. you know your 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 condolences or whatever are. Yeah, it, it wasn't that I didn't. Yeah, it's it's a strange one. Like I didn't. It's not that I didn't want. I just didn't want them to feel bad. This is the thing. Yeah. My friends felt worse than me. This is, this is where I felt like a zom- like an emotional zombie at the time. Because yeah. everyone around me were way more affected than me, which is the strangest thing. Like my best fr- friend and stuff. Like he was at rugby, and then he got the he got the news, and he just like just couldn't play the rest of the game because you know you know like it's like friends are always around at the house and stuff and like it was just but everyone's like emotional shock was more oh my god imagine how brooke's feeling if i'm feeling like this right <laughs> and then i show up and i'm just like kind of making jokes and stuff i'm just yeah. like, <laughs> i just did not react the way a normal person would react to me here but i don't know there's oh well, yeah weird kind of things that kind of line so, up to so whatever happened there whether it was denial or whether in actual fact you had I had just peace. completely accepted it yeah, yeah. Which yeah it sounds to me like you've I mean at an early age I mean mm. 15's young. pretty damn young yeah, yeah. I mean, also, I mean, we, we we should be know that you know between the in the teens anyway, we're questioning our existence anyway. So if mm. if you're able to come to that point, I think that was probably the start of my spiritual. Mm, like I was, I've always been philosophical. Like mm. you always want to ponder about life and things like yeah. that. But I think that those that just bizarrely not normal situation made me really think like, what's going on here? Like it was it was just strange. Like. You're like, there's so many things that kind of led up to it. And the fact that I kind of felt it coming, which is weird, like, and the fact that the way I reacted, it was just like, yeah, like almost peace. Like, yeah. Yeah, it was, it was just weird. Um, so, and, and that's, a, so that, I mean, that that's so relatable in many ways. Mm. Um, not wanting other people to mm. perceive you as a victim, yeah. As a victim. Well, for me, yeah, it wasn't maybe also that. It was just I didn't want them to feel bad. Right, yeah. Because I didn't. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, because I know that if I brought it up, they'll be, oh, my God, if that happened to me, like, I would, I don't know what I'd do. Because yeah. a lot of friends would be like that. And I'm just like, <laughs> I don't know. Like, I hope everyone could feel like I do because I really didn't. And that makes me sound really cold and as if I didn't love my father. My father was, like, me and him were really close. Like, right, yeah. As, and that's why I think it shocked everyone around us because, like, like especially my family, they're just like, yeah, it was just weird. It was very strange. Yeah, it was a weird time. Definitely a weird time. <laughs> so, here you are. You came to me a year ago. You are learning to sing mm. and doing really well in that, by the way. Mm, you got thanks. a lot more resonance than you ever had. And you've spoken about things. And I wanted to just pick up a little bit on a couple of things that happened with you. And you had something happen to you at the in last year, a moment of singing with someone. Oh, yeah. And it was like a first. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, so I, um, my best mate's cousin, she's a great singer. And we're all just having drinks at her house. And... You know, I told her I was, like, taking singing lessons and stuff, and then she's like, all right, come on, go to her room. And then she's like, starts putting on some music and then played. Uh, she was like, what do you want to play? I was like, oh, just play Hallelujah. And then she played, like, a different version of it, but then, like, we sang, and it was the first time I could belt in front of someone. Right. And that was, like, yeah, it was it was a really good feeling. I mean, I'm sure the drink helped a little bit, but, <laughs> <laughs> but it was just because for me it's just an annoying thing that I can't, because, you know, I'm quite soft-spoken. I don't really speak loudly. And when you belt, you really do have to go above a certain decibel. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> that, yeah. for me, is just not acceptable in normal normal mm. scenarios. I don't yeah, know. Yeah. Like, I have weird kind of mental barriers on that. And so it was nice to be able to let go and be free to sing freely, yeah, and, and just belt. And then so a friend of ours came in and listened, and that was the first time I could belt in front of another person right. who wasn't singing, you know, at the time. Sorry. I'm terrible burping problems. The burping's a great way <laughs> to release stress. And <laughs> I had a student who came to me once, and every time he went like this, he would look at me and he'd say, I am just healing. I'm healing. 
<laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and then so and then yeah. So the friend came in, and then uh, and then my best mate came in, and yeah, was still singing Hallelujah, and uh, like he cried. Wow. <laughs> which, cool? which is like probably the best compliment you could have because you know yeah. I'm still just I'm such a perfectionist, and I'm like. I'm like, oh, that bit needs work. That bit needs work. But like, two an average ear probably sounds like all good. Well, I, I, well, I'm I'm loving it. Yeah, I'm, I'm loving what you're doing. Yeah. And I, and I, I, I really no, need to get to a point where I'm satisfied, and that's going to take longer. Well, <laughs> yeah, but let's have a look at you as a as a journey as a whole. I mean, let's just be really real here. Mm. You come from a place where you thought you were unworthy. You come from a mm. place where. And yeah, like th- this, I have definitely had a good thought about, and I'm like, why is it that I am so stifled, essentially? And that it's probably like from when I was a kid, and like I was expressing some sort of expressive behavior, being loud and this and that, and I just got told, like, or even just a stern look. Shut well, you up. see, that brings up another thing, doesn't it? Mm. You couldn't be loud here, so you were loud here. Oh yeah, well you were yeah. bigger in your, you were bigger here in the personality. Mm. Right. I mean, yeah, I was, as a, to be fair, when I was in school, around my friends and stuff, I was always loud and this and that, you know, yeah. more myself, I guess. And definitely as a kid, kid, like, I I really envy my child self, because I was right. just so, I didn't have any self-consciousness, I didn't have any concern of other people, I love people, I'd talk to any soul, like, there was no fear about that, and there was no, I could just totally be myself, and people love me for it, and... I wish I could be like that. Like now, I just think way too much. <laughs> but I, I th- but I think that's that's what happens with, to this philosophical man. And when I say man, I mean everyone. Yeah. Um. We we want to find the answer, the the one answer. You know, the mm. forty two. <laughs> yeah. You know. 42. Yeah. We we're, we're looking for that one answer, and really, you know, the acceptance part says, you know, life is nuance, mm. life is complexity. <laughs> There isn't a one answer, mm. but the biggest answer, and I think it's one of the best answers that you've given today, was mm. I love me. Mm. I like who I am. Yeah, that's one thing I would wish for anyone. And so like my psychology passion, the one kind of other goal that I have is to help people help themselves. Yeah. And this definitely ties into how I help myself. Right. Obviously, there's a lot of things that I need to figure out because I'm not perfect no, no. <laughs> and and trying to find <clears throat> systems and steps at work guidelines that actually work and help I do it with my friends you know helping them out with emotional problems because like, I great give pretty good advice but I really do want to help people and the main message is just to like yourself mm. like love yourself is just thrown around way too much and yeah. people find it too cheesy and corny yeah. and it is to be fair but at the core of it it's just like yourself yeah. so many people hate themselves yeah, yeah. and that's terrible um, and if people just generally like themselves, every single human on the earth would be a lot happier. <laughs> there would probably be less wars. <laughs> well, and I think I think the thing is, is that... Uh, and there's I, a difference I, between liking yourself and loving yourself oh, and God. ego. Yeah. Pride. Absolutely. That, that hides insecurity. Yeah. I know, because I used to have a very boastful, egotistical attitude. I was the same, and some people think I am still. <laughs> and I don't blame them for doing so, because, yeah. you know, I'm... I'm oh, there's a little bit of narcissism you have to throw in there. But, yeah, well, you know, I think... I think but not you know, I at listening. the expense of others. I think I, that's the difference. This is what uh, Tom Hanks said. He was being interviewed by Graham Norton, and mm. uh, oh, I think it was Graham Norton. Oh, it might have been Parkinson, but anyway, I can't remember who it was he was being interviewed by. It was some years ago. Mm. And he said, you know, we live in, I, we, we, as in actors, live in a very narcissistic world. Mm. I mean, one of the things I get up in the morning to do is say, will these shoes suit <laughs> what I'm wearing today? You know, <laughs> yeah. I don't have one pair of shoes that I go to work in. Mm. I've got to say, hey, will this look good on the red carpet? <laughs> you know? So he yeah. says there's, there's a narcissistic kind of tendency yeah. to look at yourself and say, is this the best kind of me? Mm. I remember uh, a photo of an actress. Funny enough, I think I mentioned this before to, to the previous guest. And um, it was a photo of Angelina Jolie. Mm. And she was posed in this, in this pose like this. Mm. And my wife turned to me after looking at a magazine. She said, that woman has spent plenty of time in the mirror because that's a practice position. Mm. Yeah. So it's sometimes within our 
within the framework of our world and depending on the persona that we have, I mean, mm. right now I'm the interviewer, you're the interviewee, we're taking on these personas. Mm. I, I'm hoping to be a certain kind of individual at this moment in time that's, well, I mean, a lot of it is me. Mm. A lot of it's me mm. because I'm very interested in people. Mm. I mean, that's what I do, what I do. I, I love people's mm. changing. Did I just say people's? People changing. Like people's. You perv. <laughs> no, that's on Thursday nights after six. No, no. Um, yeah, I, I love people's the, changing. Yeah, people's changing. Yeah. <laughs> you know, when I speak, <laughs> I like I, it the people's changing. <laughs> I like it the people's changing. You know, yeah. sometimes. Um, <laughs> but you like people, yeah. Like to be fair, I used to love people. But somewhere along, like maybe teenagehood, I just became a bit more self-conscious and maybe some random comments here and there made you feel more self-conscious and then you became aware that other people can say things about you that's not very nice. It wasn't even anything, not like intense bullying, it was always just like some sort of side comment, um, just maybe out in town or whatever it is, like, oh, you're so short, that was a big one. For me, for a long time... So wait a minute, wait a minute, hold on, you're I, so short, that was a big one? <laughs> <laughs> Yes, pun intended. Yes, it no, I, I have a big <laughs> complex about being short for a long time. I'm How very, tall are you, man? 5'2", man. 5'2". Like, that's tiny. Yeah, but you, you, but you, I, you're I'm, the I'm, same, same size I'm as Asian, my wife. But I'm Asian, so I get away with it. All right. Okay. But the thing is, I was so insecure about that for so long. And mm. like, especially going to clubs and things like... Mm. Because you look, oh, I looked younger too. Without a beard, my God, I looked yeah. ten. Yeah, and, yeah. Then, and then you're short. Well, you literally people. That was the main thing. Would be like, how old are you? How old are you? How old are you? Yeah, Everywhere the eighteen I go. year old you. With yeah. The, with the with yeah, the with the, the puffy. The five, well, yeah. The, you the were like baby five fat. years old. Exactly, five years old, short, and like you go in the club, people just literally double tape. Be like, are you allowed in here? Yeah. And it really got to me. I've like, had drinks bigger than you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah. You know, I can laugh about the fact that I'm short now. I don't know because I've accepted myself completely. But it's just like I, I am short. Like, mm. There's not much I can do about it. Yeah. Care. I mean, when you came, <laughs> when you came in the other night, or the other day, there was mm. a guy who'd come in just before him. I think it was Cam. Tall. He was he was yeah. very tall, wasn't oh, yeah. he? And you were you know yeah, five oh, yeah. And so um, I, I I've got to admit, I was very conscious of that at the time. Yeah. You know, um. <laughs> That's one thing, you know, that's mm. one thing we, we you, you can do a lot about this. Mm. But you can't do much about yeah. this. Yeah. I mean, that, and that's, that's the thing. It's like at the end of the day, if there's nothing you can do to change it physically with yourself, sure, you could get surgery, but that's just a bit excessive. Yeah. <laughs> um, except it. Just there's no way what you can do. And this is, the, this is the thing where I think, whether it's this way or that way, mm. you've actually shown this evening that... Um, it's it's the mind that matters most. Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. Because there's bloody tall people who are insecure. Like yeah. some, there were six foot nine people who were like, "Oh, I'm too tall." Yeah, well, they, <laughs> which they is they hilarious. Hunch, they hunch over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then there's obviously the the small man syndrome of trying to be all big and tough yeah. when you're tiny. Puff out your chest. <laughs> which, to be fair, I can be a bit of. Ah, oh, I used to be a bit of a scrappy do when I was a kid. Scrappy do, you know, scrappy do, like yeah, like yeah, Scooby Doo, yeah. like, oh, like always feels like he's ten foot tall and bulletproof, and like <laughs> it's just you're tiny, so you always feel like you need to prove yourself. But yeah, you just kind of. But I think everybody has the the um the projected hero mm. so i mean that's why we go to the movies mm. you know we we, we want to be the hero yeah some let somebody else do it for us because that's that's mm. a, that's a far better place to be <laughs> uh, but mm. being the hero in your own story mm. and that's a bit of a cliche but i think it's important yeah definitely. we develop the hero narrative for us yeah i mean I how do you, do you feel like a hero to you for you i'm not talking about anybody else I feel like a hero for my fat self. Right. Because I really do believe they're two different people, completely. He was a wanker. No, I'm kidding, so. <laughs> I loved him, but he didn't love himself, right. unfortunately. Yeah. And th I, that was a lesson I didn't learn for way after the weight loss. Right. It, you know, at the end of the day, you just, just didn't, like, it was too much, you know, with the relationship thing, it was always relying on other people's validation. Right. To make yourself feel good. And that's still continued in relationship with the neediness thing. And again, it's like neediness is always wanting more from the other person to give to you. Right. When if you're just fine on your own and you have someone else there, you have to be cool together. Like yeah. two people, two individuals that are just good on their own, doing their own thing, but yeah. come together, that's synergy and that's yeah. love. Um, whilst if there's one depending on the other, 
emotionally, whatever it is, it's it's always going to so rather than unbalance it codependent codependence yeah more more interdependent yeah 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 so you're de- yeah. you're independent maybe not inter- interdependent well like you don't need to be de- dependent on anyone actually no but the interdependence is where both of your um independence mm. intertwines can, yeah yeah intertwines so much so that. Uh, it's not a question. It's not a question of completion. You would be complete yeah. without the individual, but what mm. they do is that everything. It's 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 a chess it's just, piece. It's an enhancement yeah. to your life. See, that's a bad cliche and uh, stereotype that people have. Is I need this other half, this my soulmate, to complete me. Mm. That already kind of reiterates that you're not enough as is, and you need this other person to make yourself feel good about yourself. And that's never, that's just always going to end bad. That yeah. that relationship, even if it's good for a bit, like eventually that person will see how much you rely on them. That will push them away. That's where I realized the neediness. I saw the thing every time I'm like, I'm trying to give to you, I'm trying to give to you, right. but it pushes them away yeah. because subconsciously that just makes them feel like, oh, why does this person think I'm just amazing when I have my own flaws? Right. You know what I mean? Everyone's not perfect. And then, if you paint someone on a pedal stool, whatever it is, that person will be like, well, I'm not perfect. Why, why are you hold me so highly? Yeah. Why, and then, I had a girlfriend who said, you know, you just got the most rose tinted glasses. <laughs> yeah. You know, and then why? And so when you put someone up, you're putting yourself down, which makes you not look very attractive. Does it mm. at the end? Of, and then they say that and you're like, Oh, I don't really want you. Mm. But then if you have someone, um, like you're, you're just completely fine on your own, just doing your own thing. And then, you know, you kind of mingle with this person and they're like, oh, this person's cool. Doesn't need anything, but yeah. it'd be cool if we, like, you know, come together a bit. Yeah. But, yeah, it's, I don't know, that that's definitely important for people to know, I think. Yeah, and I think I think this idea that, the, you know, the fat guy didn't love himself. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's a big deal, man. I it's mean, true, isn't it? Yeah. And so, like, cliche, but it's true. I think, like, are there fat people that truly love themselves? Yes, I think there are. Oh yeah, but that's and that's they're the, the ones that's who can the... really see. This is why fat people, like fat men especially, can have really beautiful girlfriends. You know the ones who are just completely like, like accepting of their body, like just take their shirt off, even if they're chubby as hell. Yeah, you know they totally don't care. There's no like mental, bad negative um, thoughts about it. And then they can be freely themselves, yeah. and then people find that attractive. I mean, but it also, I mean, it's really, really, really funny. You know, you 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 can find um, different cultures are very unaware of their their um, their inability. Oh, no, that's the wrong word. The, the, different cultures have different views of of bodies, and I'm thinking mm. particularly of Italians who go on the beach. Big old cigar, big belly, and go, hey, Mario, come. What are you, you know? Hmm. And it's it's very much, you know, like, hey, hmm. we're having a lovely time here. You want to come over? It wouldn't be. Oh, hey. No, no. It's not, it's not <laughs> self-consciousness. Yeah. And I find this with Italian women as well. You know, hmm. Italian women can be larger than life hmm. and go, hey, put the pasta on. It's okay. <laughs> we're going to have a great time, you know? I sound more Mexican, but anyway. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I but but you know I think about some of the old African and Amazonian tribes. Mm. I mean, absolutely not conscious of their bodies in in a in a in, in a in a. They don't even wear brasiers. They, no, they don't wear bras, mm. and the guys are going around in loincloths sometimes. Mm. Maybe not even. Mm. Uh, and they're climbing trees mm. for God's sake, and they are. I mean, I was listening to a podcast where they've got feet that mm. are wider Cows. than ours. And the, and the toes grip because they've oh. never worn shoes and they climb trees and they yeah, go cool. up them. Mm. Um, so, you know, that obviously shows, you know, how we evolve mm. to our, our patterns. So we've got into a place where we're almost way too thoughtful about this mm. and not not very aware of this. And matter of fact, what we've done is we've disconnected from our bodies a lot. Mm. You know? That so that was a thing for me when I was a kid. The whole fact that I didn't really care about how fat I was. I just there was no connection. I was just I was just living. I didn't really think about my body much. I think especially when you're young you're not so aware of 
You know, even with, uh, it was funny with my teeth, like I have a pretty crooked, like a little crooked overbite thing. But when my mum, when I was like young, was like, oh, do you want braces? I'm like, no, I look like a nerd. Now I'm like, I wish I got braces. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, it's, like, that was the only time I, you know, cared about my image. But like, generally when it came to my body, it just like, it didn't really, it wasn't something I really thought about. Yeah. You know, you're just having fun as a kid, just like doing stuff eating stuff <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and so your priorities change obviously as you get older mm. especially like yeah the health thing but and also generally yeah you want to look good too like eventually um <laughs> yeah. do you know what they used to call me the ugliest kid at school <laughs> uh honestly i don't, I don't see why no <laughs> uh, yeah, buck teeth I had uh, my mum my mum uh, my mum used to cut my hair so it was kind of like i this. had like a bowl cut too um I didn't realise how much that affected me, but it took me a number of years yeah. to get over this idea that I wasn't young. And I left school, yeah. and all the women I dated, plus the woman I married, were all fucking yeah. gorgeous. Yeah. And what was wrong? You know, but I believed this, yeah. you know. Um, <laughs> so, God, there, was, there was this guy called Darren Gallard. And Darren, if you're out there, mate, don't worry, you didn't affect me that much. I've had therapy. <laughs> um, but Darren, he saw me one lunchtime. I was leaning up against this uh, stairs, these stairs. And, mm. and in the corner, they, they had a, it was an all-boys school and it was an all-girls school. And it didn't have a fence between them in the, in the, in the playground. Mm. It was a white line. Mm. And the girls and the boys weren't supposed to cross over this white line. And there was this couple. And they were Good considered quite odd. He was quite an odd-looking chap. She was quite an odd-looking girl. Mm. They used to meet over by the wall and they would kiss like this, across the white line, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. right? Anyway, so I was over by the fence eating a sandwich, looking at this couple. I was 14, yeah. 15, something like that. I came back into the classroom, and I didn't know that Darren had been looking at me. <laughs> he announced to the whole fucking class, he goes, did anybody see Humphreys at lunchtime? Actually, he had a high-up voice. He went, did anybody see Humphreys at lunchtime? Like this. And like the lads in the in the class went, no. He was looking across into the girls' playground, saying, "I wish I had a girlfriend." <laughs> it was really funny. We used to take the piss out of him because his voice didn't break. <laughs> but anyway, anyway. Um, but yeah. So there, there's there was a uh, there's 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 a I don't know where I was going with that fucking thing. Yeah, there's a massive amount of humiliation, and <clears throat> and we are so conscious. Like I say, we're so conscious of of this mm. massive disconnect, mm. and we tend to find often our happiness is one place or the other. Mm. Very rarely do we actually. That's why I love meditation. That's why I love this idea of of exercise. I think exercise, mm. the very thing you're doing, is a mind body. It's mm. it's philosophy. Definitely. It's philosophy, it's psychology, you're overcoming the mm. physical. Mm. I, I really think what you've told the story of today is not a story of, like and I said this before about the body, it's not a story about changing the body. But it's, well, it's definitely philosophical, really, at yeah, the heart of it. Yeah. Um, what the hell is that noise that I keeps really, buzzing? I don't know. It just keeps but There's a buzz in here. It's all right, they won't hear it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm hoping not. But, yeah, because I realized, you know, it was like a turning point in my mind, be like, oh, so you can change these things. Yeah. And that was just like a whole new perspective. Yeah. And then that opened up life and be like, oh, what else is possible? Yeah. And then I really did believe, like, you can kind of aim for whatever you want. Right. But I really do believe anything is kind of possible if yeah. you put your mind to it. Sometimes you do need that motivational factor, yeah. whatever that is. Intrinsic's the best. It comes from you. Yeah. It comes from within. Um. But sometimes you just don't want it enough. Like now, it's like I don't really care that much to my, to be honest. With but like, that's peace. Yeah, but, I mean, because you're, you're not and acceptance. Yeah, peace and acceptance. See, that's peace. At the you... same time, it's kind of like, yeah, I'd like to do that at some point, but there's just not that annoying, like yearning to. Maybe you to need to cut out your carbs. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I might do that. No, um, but sometimes you like to hmm. do a little bit of it, but it's just not so intense. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Well, look, we've had a bit of a conversation here about yeah. all kinds of things, and I, 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 I the, the purpose of this podcast really is about ordinary people. Mm. No one, no one knows you in the world. They will now, but nobody knows mm. you in this world, right? You're not a megastar. Um, not yet. 
Not yet. <laughs> but um, but you, uh, ordinary people can do extraordinary things. Yeah, definitely. And you are a great example of somebody who's gone through loads of uh, ups and downs. Yeah, yes. but you uh, backs and forths. The the, the the challenge of finding a new pathway mm. and not being afraid to take it. I really love the idea that you haven't bought into the victim narrative, mm. that you've actually, and, and spoken about this idea of loving. You now like the fat guy more than he liked himself. Mm. And, and that's, I think that's a key part of lo loving yourself, liking yourself. Um a good way to do it is to really look back at your child self, the very insecure, the the, the vulnerable, younger version of yourself, whether that's a five-year-old, yeah. whether it's whatever age it was that maybe you got bullied or something kind of negative happened to you that really affects you still to this day. And you love them as yourself, as your adult self, as if they are your child. Right, And, yeah. and to be like, I am here for you. Yeah. You, are, you are loved, you are protected. Because when you kind of do it from that third person perspective, if you literally just saw your little self right now, you would feel that affinity. You'd be mm. like, oh, yeah, little fucker. Like, yeah. you, you know, you'd you would have that kind of, you know, like, I care about you. I, I want you to be happy. Yeah. You know, and when you kind of do it like that, you're like, oh, yeah. But that, that child's still within you because you're just a child grown up. Well, Jordan Peterson said that very thing. He said, mm. look after yourself mm. as if you were loving someone else externally, mm. you know? Yeah. yeah, you, you know, yeah. And I, it, you would probably take more care exactly, of yeah. your cat yeah. oh, than I you. <laughs> yeah, and it's crazy when people, you know, even people are amazing friends to their friends, but they just talk so badly about them to themselves. Right. Um, and put themselves down. It's like, would you ever say that to one of your close friends? Yeah. And that's where you really have to treat yourself as yeah. your best friend. Yeah. Because you're kind of stuck with yourself. Mm. This world could blow up and you could be the last person on the earth. Mm. You are with yourself to yeah. the end. You better just kind of join the you team. You better do yourself a lot better than you. Yeah. Than you. Uh, like, yeah, yeah. you're a team with yourself. Yeah. And that makes you productive. That makes you successful. That, that makes you happier. Of, uh, that reminds me of. Uh, Joan Armour trading song. You don't know Joan Armour trading, do you? I don't you? know these people. Yeah, I know. It's because I'm so old. Too old. Oh. But, you know, yeah, that's right. Too old. <laughs> but, I mean, she wrote a song, Me, Myself, I. Mm. And the, when I think about Me, Myself, I, I think to myself, well, you know what? Those are... <laughs> I am... Me, Myself, and I. Yeah, I... I but, but <laughs> yeah, of course I am, but... <laughs> I am... Well, I'm so much more well versed in me than I am in anybody else, mm. and I'm surely can do me so much better mm. than anybody else. So mm. Why am I putting so much energies trying to change someone else, mm. trying to uh, perceive somebody else in such a way mm. when I need to have my changed perception of me? Mm. The perception of me should be mm. actually. Do you know what? I'm okay. Mm. I'm okay. Mm. And the fact that you can't control what other people say or do to you or about you. Um, and so in that sense, your your fallback is that you've always got your back, regardless. You could lose all your friends, family, whatever. People could say horrible things to you. But at the end of the day, if you truly just have your back, you can kind of get through anything. Yeah. And that that's the key to resilience and mm. being able to overcome adversity whatever it is because you have that stability within yourself you don't need that external that's right source yeah and that could be you know a lot of people turn alcohol and cigarettes yeah. and drugs and yeah. other things to cope but that's not really coping because you're just kind of numbing yourself yeah. well i've done that kind of thing mm. uh, and you I mean you've done it with food mm. yeah right. definitely um as my mother would say bullshit to the world Mm -hmm. No, just literally, just let the world go. Mm. You don't have to please it. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. That was extraordinary, fun. Extraordinary, extraordinary things from an ordinary man, but you are extraordinary, sir. <laughs> Finger guns. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so look, look out for this. Share uh, Brooks' story, especially with those who you find are struggling with weight loss with their mental health because mm. uh, you've definitely got a story that's well worth mm. talking about and I hope to have you back again mm. six months mm. see where you are let's see 
you know, you might have might have said, hey, Charles, look, I'm eating 25 kgs of carbs each day. <laughs> Jesus, I look like a potato. <laughs> How would you look like a potato? Oh, you look like a dilly dear potato. Potato <laughs> right. Um, all my Irish friends. Hello. Don't take offence. Yeah, no, please. To take offence. Take offence. Irish. <laughs> There's nothing <laughs> butchered about this at all, at all, at all. Oh, it's pretty butchered. Okay, it's fair, right. fairly butchered. Right. <laughs> uh, Brooke, once again, thank you so much. No worries. Uh, that was fun. Yeah, that was a bit fun, wasn't it? Just mm. chatting about shit Seven that really yard. mattered. Yeah. Yeah. It was good. Yeah. So, uh, it's a nice purple tea you got. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> cut. Cut. See you later. I want to thank all the Patreon, PayPal, YouTube and Facebook subscribers for supporting this channel, along with those who have already casually found the purple chair. Please like, subscribe and press the notifications bell. That really helps the channel and it lets you know when new content is available. The purple chair interviews are for you, hoping to inspire you in your own endeavours. If you haven't already signed up to the other channels, a list of them is available in the description.